Good morning. Joy to greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I add my greetings to everyone else who has been up here already this morning and glad to see everyone. Um, and uh, it's been a good couple weeks uh, here in Prague for me and um, sadly have to, to go back to the United States tomorrow. Um, and we'll be back again, but I don't know exactly when. Uh, and so, but we still just appreciate all of your prayers for us in this transition process. And um, we know that the Lord will have us here uh, together uh, permanently soon. So we look forward to that. Um, so we continue this morning uh, in our series, Grace in a Foreign Place, um, as we look at the uh, prophet Jonah from the Old Testament. And um, I love Jonah. I don't know if I said that last week or not, but I'll just say it again. I really love Jonah. I think his story is so unique uh, in the Old Testament with the Old Testament prophets, uh, partly because he really just doesn't want to do what God is asking him to do. Now, he's not unique in that. Uh, we see that with other prophets in the Old Testament. Moses, I thought of in particular, you know, Moses has this back and forth with God where he finally gets to the point where he just says, God, just send someone else, anyone. And God says, no, you're the person for the job. And I think Jonah's the only one who actually runs away from God, uh, gets on a boat and tries to get as far away from pos- as he can from God uh, as possible. And, and one of the things that I often think about with Jonah is, is the question that pops in my mind is, is how are we to think about Jonah as a prophet? Is he a good prophet? Is he a successful prophet? Uh, Jonah runs away from God. He sort of gets forced into this uh, task that God has for him. And yet, When Jonah goes and preaches repentance in Nineveh, the people repent. And that doesn't happen with all of the prophets that we see. A lot of them go and they proclaim the message that God gives them and the people reject their message and reject them. And yet Jonah goes and he preaches the message and the people actually repent. And then Jonah is unhappy about this. Uh, And I know Vince is going to talk about that more next week, but Jonah's unhappy about this. So is he a good prophet or not? I'm going to let Vince answer that question (laughs) next week. He doesn't want to see what happens, and he he kind of gets angry about it, right? At least part of what we see in the story of Jonah is that God uses us, sinful people, to bring about his good purposes, often in spite of ourselves, often in spite of ourselves. And so grace in a foreign place. I've been thinking about that theme, the name of that theme, and and Vince, thank you for giving that to us. I've just been thinking about that so much over the last several weeks. It's such a great title for this series because that is what the book of Jonah is all about, grace in a foreign place. God's grace coming to people who are far away from him. These these Ninevites, these people who are described as wicked, people who relish in their sin, People who weren't looking for it, who didn't deserve it, and yet God saw fit to reveal himself to them anyway. And I think that we also find that God's grace is being extended to Jonah throughout this book as well, that God is offering his grace to his prophet. And really, this isn't just the story of Jonah, but the story of all of Scripture, that God's grace is being extended to people who are far from him. People who don't deserve it and who aren't looking for it. God seeks these people out and he reveals himself to them so that they might be saved. And thanks be to God for that, that he does that. So last week and this week, we've been taking a break from looking actually at the book of Jonah itself, but we've been using the book of Jonah as sort of a launching point uh, to jump to these uh, New Testament passages uh, and look at how knowing and understanding Jonah, we can come to a deeper understanding of Jesus Christ himself. And so last week we looked at the story of Jesus calming the storm, and and there's not an explicit reference to Jonah in that story, but what we might call echoes of the Old Testament that appear uh, in that New Testament story. One of my uh, professors in seminary says that you see these echoes of the Old Testament in the New Testament, and they're supposed to point us back to the Old Testament to see how these stories inform each other. But this morning we're going to look at a passage uh, where there is an explicit connection where Jesus relates himself to Jonah explicitly. And so if you would like to uh, follow along, you can turn with me in your Bibles to uh, the Gospel according to Matthew uh, chapter 12, and we'll be looking at verses 38 through 42, the sign of Jonah. And you can also just uh, follow along if you'd like just to listen along. 
And let's just take a moment to pray. Lord, we ask this morning that whatever you have to say to us, that you would prepare our hearts to receive it. We thank you for the gift of your word that you have given to us through your prophets and apostles that you have authored by your Holy Spirit. And Lord, we pray that you would speak to us once again today from your holy word. And we ask this all in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Then some of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. And in my version, it says a miraculous sign. And Jesus answered, a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a miraculous sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And now one greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom. And now one greater than Solomon is here. This is the word of the Lord. Uh, Thanks be to God. So this passage falls. We're going to give you a little context of what's happening in Matthew. I think it'll help us understand what's happening uh, better in this passage. It falls in the middle of Jesus' teaching and healing ministry. He's been traveling all around Galilee. He's been performing different miracles. He's been healing people of their diseases and their ailments. Uh, he's been casting out demons from people. He calmed the storm, the story that we looked at last week. and We looked at God, the Gospel of Mark's version of it. And he's also been doing some significant teaching. He's been telling people about God's kingdom. He's been teaching them about the law and about what it looks like to live as God's followers. And he's been calling people to repentance. And much of of this teaching of Jesus's we see encapsulated in the Sermon on the Mount, which takes place earlier in Matthew. Some of Jesus's most well-known teachings are in Matthew chapter 5 through 7. And along the way, as Jesus is going about his ministry, as he's teaching and performing miracles, uh, he goes about his ministry, he starts to gain quite a following of people. There are the disciples, the people that he has called to come uh, and to be part of his inner circle. These are the ones that he he is the closest to, and he gives power and authority to them, and who he, uh, he eventually passes his ministry to. But he also gains the attention of many other people as well. There are crowds of people who start to follow Jesus. There are people who want to hear what he has to say. There are people who hope to see him perform miracles. People who want to be healed by him themselves. There are those people in those crowds who have become true believers already. These are people who are putting their hope and their trust in him and what he has to say. Believing that he is truly from God. But there are also parts of these crowds, people who are following him, out of just a sense of curiosity. They want to know what this guy is all about. Why are there so many people that are following him? What's the big deal here? But they're not quite ready to fully commit yet. And these are the people that we see uh, start to walk away when Jesus gives his more difficult teachings, like the cost of following him. And then Jesus catches the attention of another group of people too. And these are the people who really don't like what he has to say. These are the people who don't appreciate what he's doing. And so they form a sort of an opposition group. These are people who challenge Jesus' teachings. They, They question his motives and his purpose. And they even begin to plot against him. These are the people that we find interacting with Jesus in our passage today, the people who are opposed to him. And it's interesting when we look at these different responses to Jesus' ministry from people who were following him around back then, that a lot of these are the same responses that people still have to Jesus and to his teachings. There are those people who, who fully accept him, who receive Jesus as their Lord and who give their lives to him because of the teaching that they see or hear. And then there are those who have a certain curiosity about Jesus. Uh, They want to see what it's all about, but they're not quite ready to commit yet. And then there are those people who reject him. 
Sometimes uh, they come with a certain sense, that rejection can come with a certain sense of, of not caring. They're people who don't believe, but they're fine if others do. But often this rejection of Jesus can come with true feelings of opposition. There are people who find the message of the gospel an offense and who truly work against it. And this has been true wherever the gospel has been preached, that there are people who have eagerly received Jesus' message. There are those who have opposed it. There have been those who have accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, and there are those who have rejected him. That's been true wherever the gospel has been preached throughout history. And sometimes we even see the response to Jesus change within someone's own life. We see disciples whose hearts then become hardened. Judas is the prime example of that. But then we also see there are those who oppose the gospel, whose hearts then become softened to God. And we see the Apostle Paul be the prime example of that in Scripture. It doesn't always seem to make sense why people respond to God the way that they do. And often it's the opposite of what we might expect. And that's part of what we see happening in our passage today. Jesus is favorably comparing the Ninevites, a wicked and idolatrous people, to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, Israel's religious elite, the ones who study the scriptures all the time, the ones who follow all of the rules. These are the ones that we would think would be closest to God. And yet Jesus is saying, no, the Ninevites are going to rise up at the judgment day and they are going to condemn you. This is not what we would expect to hear. The opposite makes more sense where the religious people are the ones who are praised and the Ninevites condemned. And yet here we are. So let's go take a deeper look at what's going on here. Our passage today begins with the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asking Jesus to show them a miraculous sign. <clears throat> now this may make sense because Jesus has been going around performing miracles and we can, might understand why they would ask for that, but this isn't just a friendly request. It's meant as a challenge to Jesus. These people are his opponents. It reminds me a little bit of, of when I was growing up as a kid and when I would play with other kids, either at school or church or uh, in the neighborhood, wherever it is. Uh, and I don't know if this is true for everyone here, uh, but sometimes when kids would get together and play with each other, there could start to be sort of bragging. Uh, and boasting that would go on. Uh, and, and people would start to talk about the different things that we could do. And usually what we were trying to do was to outdo each other in some way, to trying to make ourselves look better or more impressive than someone else or the rest of the group. And so someone uh, might say something like, well, you know, I can kick a football this far, right? just to impress everybody. And then someone else would come in and say, oh, that's not that big a deal. I can kick a football twice as far as that. And so people would start to brag and we would start to up the stakes and it could be whatever it was. Uh, it might be about how strong you are. I can lift that huge rock right up over my head or it might be about how fast you can run. Something of that nature. Whatever it was, the purpose was to show ourselves to be better than someone else, the rest of the crowd. Now, I said I did that as a kid. I can't swear that I've never gotten into a conversation like that as an adult. Uh, I'm sure none of you have ever done that before. But eventually, in all of the bragging and all of the boasting, eventually someone would make a claim about something that went just a little too far. And when that would happen, someone would step in and challenge them with some form of saying, prove it, right? Prove it. Oh yeah, you can kick a, a football uh, over a kilometer? Okay, prove it. <laughs> Let's see it. Let's get the, I've got the ball right here. You kick this ball and prove yourself to us. And so the Pharisees and the teachers of the law in our passage today, not in such a friendly rivalry sort of way, but what they're asking Jesus for is a sign. And it's not meant as a friendly gesture or simply as the fulfillment of their curiosity. Uh, what they are asking Jesus to do is to prove it to prove himself to them. Show us a miraculous sign. The exchange is coming at the end of a series of controversies and confrontations between Jesus and the religious leaders of the time. And this request is meant as a challenge to him because what they really want is to undermine Jesus' ministry and to reestablish their own influence and their own authority in people's spiritual lives. And so they ask Jesus to prove himself. Teacher, 
we want to see a miraculous sign. What they're really saying is, Jesus, if your teaching and ministry are really from God, if you are really sent here by our Heavenly Father, then prove it. Prove it. Show us a sign. And we mean something really big, a miraculous sign, a sign from heaven, something that is unquestionably supernatural from God that shows us who you are. Prove yourself. And this challenge from the Pharisees to Jesus raises a lot of questions, at least it does for me. What kind of a sign are they looking for? What kind of a sign are they looking for? Uh, Signs and wonders have been following Jesus wherever he goes. He's been casting out demons. He's been healing people of their ailments. Uh, What else do they need to see? What else is it that Jesus needs to show them, to prove himself And another question that I have uh, that comes from this exchange is what would have changed for the Pharisees if Jesus had given them the sign that they asked for? What would have changed for them? Would this really have made any difference in their lives, those whose hearts were so hardened towards the Lord? Were they really just waiting for Jesus to perform some huge miracle, something bigger than he had already done in order to become his followers? Is that all they were looking for? This wasn't really the point in the Pharisees asking Jesus for a sign. By challenging Jesus in this way, they're trying to control him. They want him to play the game by their rules, on their terms. If Jesus doesn't give them a sign, then they've proved him false. He's not from God. That's what they could say. But if Jesus does do what they ask, then they've shown that they can get Jesus to do whatever they want that they have controlled him in some way, that they have the authority over Jesus. In either way, it can be a win for the Pharisees. But Jesus refuses to fall into their trap because he knows what they're up to. And so his rebuke to the Pharisees is strong and swift. He says, a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign. Or in other words, what he's saying to them is, this is not a faithful response to what you see God doing. What you are asking of me is not a faithful response to what you see God doing through me. And then he goes on to say, no sign will be given to you except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the big fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So Jesus doesn't completely shut down the Pharisees and their request for a sign, but the response is going to be on God's terms and not on theirs. There will be a sign. That sign is coming. And here's what you should be looking for to know if I am really from our Heavenly Father. Vince talked about this a few weeks ago when he preached on uh, Jonah being swallowed by the fish. Uh, And he was talking about how that time for Jonah inside the fish was really a sort of a death and rebirth for Jonah. That God was using that time and that experience to change something in Jonah. And we see that in the prayer that Jonah prays from inside the fish in Jonah chapter 2. Well, in the same way, Jesus is going to spend three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, which will be a time of death and rebirth for him. But it's also a time of death and rebirth for all of humanity. This is where we see uh, what Peter is talking about in his first letter, chapter 3, verse 18, when he said that Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit. When Jesus went to the cross, he took all of our sin with him. And when he rose from the grave, something had changed. He had been given a new body, but he had also opened the way for us to eternal life. This was Jesus' prove it moment for everyone. The resurrection. Do you want to know if I am from God? This is how I've proved it. Do you want a sign? The resurrection is your sign. Do you want a sign? The resurrection is your sign. Do you want to know if I've really been sent here by the Heavenly Father? If if what I'm doing is a part of his work, then just wait and you will see, is what he's telling these Pharisees. Remember what happened with Jonah? 
Well, something similar is going to happen with me, and that will be your sign. Now, of course, this word was for the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who were challenging Jesus here, but I think it's a word that many of us need to hear as well. There's a challenge here for those of us who are looking for God to give us a sign. And if I'm completely honest, there are times when I want that, when I want God to give me a sign, when I want God to prove himself to me in some way. So when I say that we need to hear this, it's not to say that we shouldn't expect to see God's miraculous work in the world. Still today, of course we should. And it's not to say that we shouldn't pray for God's guidance or for affirmations of his will for us. Of course we should pray those things. But there's a way in which we can sometimes approach God the same way that these Pharisees and teachers of the law are doing, demanding some sort of sign, asking God to prove himself to us. And we should ask ourselves the question, why do we demand signs? What is it that we are really looking for when we do that? At times, perhaps it's our way of negotiating with God or even trying to manipulate God into doing what we want. Or perhaps it's our excuse for getting out of something that we don't want to do. Some uh, claim that God has on us that we don't want to actually be true. We may have prayers in our hearts that run along the lines, uh, something like this. Jesus, I will believe you if. Jesus, I will follow you if this happens. If I see you work in this specific way. Lord, I will give you my entire life. But I need you to do this one thing first. Lord, give me a sign. And then, then I will be fully committed to you. Show us a sign, God. Prove yourself. Prove yourself. Now, of course, the question for us is the same as it was for the Pharisees. Is this really where the problem lies? If you were to get the sign that you demand from God, would you then fully submit your life to Christ? Is that really how that works? Jesus' word for us is the same as it was for the Pharisees if we put ourselves in that position that this is what a wicked and adulterous people ask for. People who are not faithful to me ask for this kind of a sign. And so he says the same thing to us as he says to them also, your sign is the same as it is for everyone. The resurrection. The resurrection is your sign. I died on the cross. I was buried for three days and for three nights. I was brought back to life to forgive your sins and bring you to God. What more do you need? Friends in Christ, what more do you need than the resurrection to know that Jesus Christ is truly the Son of God who has been sent here to bring us back into a relationship with him? What Jesus is calling us to do is to put our faith and our trust in him and in his redeeming work. And if we are given the the gift of experiencing miraculous things in our lives, of seeing those happen either to us or around us, then we can give thanks to the Lord for that. We can praise God for those things. But it's not to be where we place our faith. Our faith is meant to be put in Christ himself and in his completed work on the cross not in the signs and wonders. Well, the connections to Jonah don't stop there. Jesus goes on in our passage to give what is a bit of a warning. He says to the uh, Pharisees this, the men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and they will condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah and now one greater than Jonah is here. And then he goes on to bring in another Old Testament story, one from 1 Kings about the queen of Sheba and her exchange with King Solomon. And the queen of Sheba had heard of Solomon's wisdom. He had had great reputation that had spread to faraway lands. And so she had come from a faraway place uh, to hear Solomon's wisdom, which had been given to him from the Lord. And she ends up praising God, the God of Israel, because of Solomon's wisdom. And Jesus says that she too will rise at the judgment with this generation and condemn it because now one greater than Solomon is here, 
one whose wisdom is greater than Solomon's, is here. Of course, referring to himself. Jesus is using these two examples of people from foreign places. People who had been worshiping foreign gods. But they had responded faithfully to the God of Israel. And so they were in a better place in the final judgment than the Pharisees and the teachers of the law that Jesus was dealing with. They were the ones who were rejecting him and his message, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Jesus is using the Ninevites and the Queen of Sheba to show us what a faithful response to him looks like. It's not demanding a miraculous sign. It's listening and repentance. That is our faithful response to God. Listening and repentance. The Queen of Sheba listened to the Lord's wisdom through Solomon, and it led her to a place of praise. The Ninevites heard Jonah's call to repent, and they heeded it. And because of that, they avoided the death and the destruction that was coming for them, that God had planned for them. To respond faithfully to God for us looks the same. We are to listen to his word given to us in the scriptures, and we should praise him for it and put it into practice in our lives. And we can only do this if we are familiar with his word, if we are spending time reading it and studying it and learning it. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, it's the very end of the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus uh, uses this parable, the well-known parable, about building your house on the rock. And what he says there is this, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built their house on the rock. And he goes on to say, the rains came and the streams rose and the winds blew against it, but it did not fall because its foundation was on the rock. So we should listen to God's word and put it into practice. And we should repent. And this is what Jonah called the Ninevites to do. It's what Jesus calls us to do. It's part of our faithful response to him. A simple definition of repentance is just to turn around and go in the other direction. That's what it means to repent. Turn around and go in the other direction. Jesus calls us to leave our life of sin and to follow him. And he puts it this way in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. We'll put that slide back up. Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. If anyone would come after me, they must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. This is what a life of repentance looks like. It's a daily walk with the Lord of turning away from our sin and following him. Listening in repentance. This is our faithful response to God. And of course, there's more that could be said about how we can faithfully, faithfully respond to God, but this is what we're given in this passage today. Listening and repentance. Jesus gives us a warning about the consequences of not responding faithfully to him. But the warning of judgment that we see in our passage comes under the umbrella of grace, and we always need to look at it that way. The warning of judgment always comes under the umbrella of grace. The best way to understand it is, is with knowing that we are already dead in our sins. Without Christ, we are dead in our sins. But now, life is available through him, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. This is what we find with the Ninevites, that death and destruction was theirs. But God extended them grace, and they received it through their repentance. And if a wicked people who are far from God, like the Ninevites, can experience God's grace and salvation, then so can each one of us. Because as Jesus says in our passage today, we have been given what is greater. We have been given what is greater. Jesus, the true prophet, greater than Jonah. Jesus, the true king, greater than Solomon. Friends, Living as we do on this side of the cross, we are not asked to put our faith in a promise that is to come, but we are asked to put our faith in something that has already been done, a promise that has already been fulfilled. Jesus Christ, crucified and risen. It was while we were yet sinners that Christ died for us. Friends, we are those people who were far from God, 
who weren't necessarily looking for it, who didn't deserve it, and yet God saw fit to reveal himself to us so that we might be saved. We have received grace in a foreign place. Give thanks to God for that. Amen. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you looked down on us and you loved us in all of our sin and all of our lostness. And you saw fit to reveal yourself to us through your word and most especially through your son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you that through him that we have been given away back into a relationship with you. Lord, we pray today that you would give us faith to trust in Jesus and in his completed work on the cross, that we would not ask you to prove yourself to us, Lord, but that we would trust in what you have already shown us. Thank you, Lord, for all you have done for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.